Mark comes up to you and he says, you won't believe what I just got. And he's probably right because you know Mark. He's the guy who believes all the dumb shit. He's the guy that's always bragging about how well his airborne is working, how good his chiropractor is, how hot jet fuel does and doesn't burn. He's a good guy, but he's gullible as fuck. So if you could have made an excuse to cut him off, you probably would have. But at this point, it'd be rude. He kind of has you cornered. So you sigh softly, you die a little bit inside, and you take the bait. What did you just get, Mark? Now, secretly, you're hoping that you get fired or something before he can launch into whatever homeopathic bullshit he's come across this time, but you don't. And now that he sees he's got your undivided attention, he decides he's not going to make it easy on you by just answering your fucking question. So he asks you, he says, you know what the leading cause of death is in the U.S.? Heart disease, you answer. And even though that's right, it's clearly not the answer he was looking for. So he rephrases the question. He says, I mean, what's the leading cause of non-heart disease death? You say cancer. And again, you're right. But again, that's not the answer he was looking for. He says, I mean, the one after that. Chronic lower respiratory diseases, you ask? And again, you're right, but this isn't what he wants either. He says, what I mean, flailing at this point, is what's the actual leading cause of non-disease like disease type deaths? And by now, even though you know the answer, you can't help but phrase it as a question. So you say, accidental poisonings? And once again, he's disappointed. He goes, um, after that? So you say, auto accidents? Exactly, he finally exclaims, auto accidents, the number one cause of non-disease type, non-poisoning type deaths in the entire country. You nod, and he continues, he says, but I don't have to worry about those anymore because I just upgraded my car with the most advanced state-of-the-art newest safety feature in the world, and now I never have to worry about me or my family dying in a car wreck again. I'm trying to keep the note of stark terror out of your voice. You ask for details. He says, you ever seen Demolition Man with Sylvester Stallone? And you nod, because for the sake of the second person nature of this diatribe, you have seen this movie. Mark continues, he says, you remember that bit where Stallone gets in a wreck and his car fills up with that safety foam so nobody gets hurt? You say, yeah, where he says the car turned into a cannoli. He says, the emergency cannoli foam, exactly. Well, that's what I just got. Got it installed in my car last week, and now I can drive as fast as I want in any kind of weather and never have to worry about it. It's such a relief. Can't tell you how much easier it's made my morning commute. Now, your mark policy is normally to kind of just nod along until he goes away, but your conscience isn't going to allow it this time around. He's got three kids, and the idea that he thinks his car is death-proof over some imaginary safety upgrade is too dangerous to ignore. So you let him down as easily as you can while explaining that there is no such thing as emergency cannoli foam. But he's insistent. He wants to prove it. So you wander out to the parking lot with him. He pops the hood of his car. Right along the side of the engine block, you see a series of out-of-place canisters all lined up and held in place with duct tape. He points at it. He says, you see them? That's the emergency cannoli only foam right there. Soon as your car gets into an accident, these cans detect it, they fill the car right up, and then it hardens in place so nobody moves, nobody gets hurt. And after a brief examination, you break it to them that those canisters are clearly empty Barbasol cans with the words emergency foam handwritten on a piece of box tape. And at first he digs his heels in a bit, but when you point out that there's no J in emergency, he reluctantly admits that maybe something is amiss here. Of course, he doesn't want to admit that he's been ripped off, so it takes a while to convince him, but eventually you do. For the sake of his kids, you can't help but keep chipping away at it until he knows his car isn't invincible. So after a couple of days, he admits that his emergency cannoli foam doesn't work, but he's still convinced that it's only because he bought the wrong emergency cannoli foam. So you have to keep at it for a little longer, and after a Herculean effort on your part, he eventually comes around to the truth. There is no such thing as emergency cannoli foam. So you pat yourself on the back for a job well done, you reward yourself with a few skeptic points, maybe treat yourself to some octopus porn or whatever it is you're into. It's octopus porn, admit it. But the point is, you think the whole ordeal is over, but apparently it's not. Because now, whenever Mark finds himself in heavy traffic and it's raining and his kids are in the back seat and he gets nervous, he calls you. He asks you what to do. I mean, when he was in the same situation with his bogus emergency cannoli foam, it actually was easier. Wouldn't have done him a lick of good if he got into a wreck, but it sure as hell offered him peace of mind when the drive got a bit scary. And because you were the one that convinced him he was relying on nonsense, he seems to think that you owe him emergency cannoli foam. Of course, he never had anything to begin with, but he still feels like he lost something and he feels like it's your fault. He begrudgingly accepts that he's better off knowing it was all bullshit, but from time to time, he still gets angry that he no longer has that feeling of security, illusory or otherwise. And here's the weirdest thing. Once in a while, you actually feel guilty. You actually feel like you do owe him something. 
I mean, you did rip away his comforting illusion of invulnerability, and all that you offered in its place was be sure to check your tire pressure and get regular tune-ups. Nothing you can say is going to alleviate his apprehension like the emergency cannoli foam did. And yeah, sure, you definitely did the right thing. In the long run, you saved him money, you educated him, you spared him the dangers of treating extant problems as though they were resolved, but he's a nervous fucking wreck now. He's objectively less happy now than he was before he had that information that you thrust upon him. Information he didn't want and resisted when you offered it. So I guess that pang of guilt is to be expected. It's natural. But doing someone a favor doesn't obligate you to do them more favors later. You already know this, of course, but I'm telling you anyway, you're still the hero in this story. Being an outspoken atheist and skeptic is going to cost you a friend or two. It'll cause you some conflicted guilt here and there. It's most often an entirely thankless endeavor. And that's exactly what makes it heroic.